Hi everyone, we are going to start. And so my name is Christina Sammons and I'm from the Law Office of Martin Lee. Today we are talking about social media and ethics and it's supposed to be fun, so I hope you guys all have fun. <laughs> okay, so all of us are probably familiar with social media, I assume we all are since it's everywhere. Um, and so I thought, what better definition for social media than from Wikipedia, which is crowdsourced. So, so Wikipedia <laughs> defines social media as interactive computer-mediated technologies that facilitate the creation and sharing of information, ideas, career interests, and other forms of expression via virtual communities and networks. And so how does this apply to our work? <laughs> And I would say that it applies a lot. It permeates all aspects of our work, I think, because social media use is so ubiquitous amongst uh, attorneys, judges, and our clients, as I'm sure you're all aware. Mm. I'm sure you all have that case where someone tries to introduce a Facebook post from your client. Mm -hmm. Um, so because of the prevalence of social media in our, in our uh, society, the ethical consequences of using social media is getting more attention. But it's not really defined that well. And I'll go into a few scenarios and just talk about some issues that you should think about. But I think that social media can impact all of the ethical duties. Basically, I, put in, I boil it down to five, but everything can be impacted by social media. Uh, first, I just want to go over where you can get sources for ethical information. Uh, and again, like I said, there there isn't any case law that I could find on these issues where an attorney has been sued for some breach of ethical duties because of social media. However, <laughs> you don't want to be that case, right? Um, there are a lot of advisory opinions from multiple states about social media. And so I just want to preface this training by saying that I'm not going to give you hard and fast rules and say in this situation you have to do X or don't do X, but just think about these issues really. So the sources for information, um, the first one is the California Rules of Professional Conduct, the CRPC, I'll be calling it CRPC throughout this training, and I just wanted to note that it was recently updated and the State Bar and the California Supreme Court approved the new numbering of the rules in November of last year. So a lot of the rules are the same as before, which the prior numbering system was like 1-400, 2-100. Now it's all in line with the model rules. There's also official ethics opinions that are distributed by this California bar. There's a hotline, which is really useful. If you have any issue, it's confidential, you can call the state bar hotline and you ask them like, hey, what happens if I friend my client on social media? And they'll refer you to some opinions and other resources to check. There's also local opinions, so LA County Bar Association obviously is ours, but there's also Orange County, San Diego, all over. And then lastly, the model rules of professional responsibility, which are the American Bar Association rules, which are not technically <coughs> binding on us because we have our own California rules, but those can also provide guidance. There's also statutory rules, so Business and Professions Code Section 6068 is the specific statute that deals with <coughs> attorney duties to the client. So that is also something that you should be very familiar with because that's in addition to the state bar rules, it's actually statutory. <coughs> and lastly, local rules from California and LA, and then case law. So why should we care about this? So, <coughs> Again, you don't want to be that first case that the state bar disbars you because of some sort of misuse of social media. The first consequence is state bar proceedings. So these are disciplinary. They're handled in the state bar courts, which is in downtown LA. They're not handled by the regular civil courts. But you have to know that these cases are public and you could possibly be put on probation. Your license could be suspended or even in extreme cases, you could be disbarred and any discipline that you are subject to is, is showing, will show up on your state bar record. So if you Google yourself on the, the attorney record, it will say at the bottom, like history of disciplinary actions. So you don't want for future clients looking you up and being like, mm, I don't know if this person's gonna be a good attorney. 
You also can be facing a legal malpractice lawsuit. Again, there's no examples of that right now, but it's possible. And these two sort of soft factors, which is just having a poor professional reputation, people being like, oh yeah, that person posts all the time on social media about their cases, like she shouldn't do that, and also maybe losing your job. So um, I want to now take you through some hypothetical situations that can implicate our ethical duties of, as attorneys. A lot of these are made up, but I think they provide potential guidance and they're good thought experiments to give you ideas on how to analyze your actions with reference to the ethical rules. So first, scenario one, posting case info on your social media. So examples, I'm sure you can think of more, but posting pictures of your files. Um, and just being, you know, posting on Facebook like crazy day at work, posting pictures of files. Yes, you're not actually maybe showing reports or like referencing confidential information, but if there's a case number on there, that's could subject to possible liability maybe. Posting about case facts, posting about <coughs> that crazy thing your client said that day, referencing DCFS reports, discussing wins or, or and or losses with details of the case, posting memes referencing your case or client. Um, so, your ethical duty may be violated even if you don't directly quote a report or client communication. So, yes, we all know attorney-client privilege exists. We all know that we shouldn't disclose confidential information of our client. But I still think that it's possible that you'll be subject to liability if you just reference something. Like, oh, my client said I was the worst attorney ever because I... Because uh, my parental rights got terminated, or her parental rights got terminated, but she sucks. Probably not advisable to do that. <coughs> so here is an outline of the new CRPC rules regarding confidential information. I know it's a lot of words, but essentially it's very, very strict in California. A lawyer shall not reveal information protected by disclosure from Business and Professions Code Section 6068, which I put here, unless the client gives informed consent or the disclosures permitted by paragraph B. Now paragraph B, I didn't put in, but that's the one about if you need to disclose something to prevent serious bodily injury or death to another person. So yes, that is an exception, but really California statute says attorneys must main, maintain inviolate the confidence and at every peril to himself or herself to preserve the secrets of his or her client. That's very, very strong language. So you should be extremely careful about, about this. I also put a note that in our courts, there's WIC 827, which specifically prohibits the disclosure of case information, case reports, and if you violate that, that's a misdemeanor and you could be punished by a $500 fine. So not only could you be subject to losing your state bar license, you also could be fined and subject to criminal prosecution. So scenario two, friending your client. Whoa. So, <laughs> we laugh, but this happens. I won't name names, but anyway, friending your, friending your client can have positive consequences. It can also have negative consequences. So I think on the positive side, this can assist you in your duty to communicate with your client. So here is the rule about communicating with clients. Again, very long, but you have to do all of these things. Promptly inform the client of any decision or circumstance. Um, reasonably consult with the client about the means by which to accomplish the client's objectives, keep the client reasonably informed about developments, advise the client on any limitations of your conduct. So I, you could, if it's convenient, communicate with your client via social media. Maybe they don't have a phone, um, maybe they don't have email, but they have Facebook. And so that could possibly be a good way for you to use social media. But Again, you need to make sure that you're keeping everything confidential. So don't use the wall posts. <laughs> uh, there, is a, there is a opinion from Pennsylvania from 2014. That's an advisory opinion, but it also says that you can advise your client, and you should advise your client of the content of their social media and how that could affect their case. So for example, there's a case in Florida where this man got a confidential set settlement for um, like a discrimination case, 
and he won $800,000, I believe, and it was confidential, right? That was part of the agreement. Then his daughter posted on social media, hey, like, we're, my family's going on vacation thanks to the company. Uh, and then the man had to give the money back because that violated the confidentiality agreement of that settlement. So some possible negative consequences of friending your client on social media. And again, I, these are just ideas, so if you have any other ideas, feel free to raise your hand. But one is that in representing a client, you shall not, one, unlawfully harass or unlawfully discriminate against persons on the basis of any protected characteristic, or unlawfully retaliate against persons. Now, this maybe seems like, how does this apply? But I was thinking of a scenario where possibly you can seem to maybe be disloyal to your client if you're posting things on your social media that they can see that are negative to the client. So for example, I was thinking, I was thinking like, okay, so you post on your Facebook, oh man, like God, people who have more than five kids need to just stop having kids. We, like, I hate it when people have more than five kids. Well, maybe your clients have more than five kids. And that client might read that and think, well, is my client actually fighting for me? Are they actually going to do their job because they say they hate people with more than five kids? Or, I don't know. Think of more examples. It's quite fun to think of them. They're like, oh, I hate everyone on welfare. Like, people should pay for themselves. That, I mean, a lot of our clients probably have government benefits that, again, could rise to a conflict between your duty of loyalty to your client and your representation. Um, also, this one is about inadvertently transmitted writing. So this is the rule where basically if you, if you get a communication from someone that you believe is privileged, attorney-client privileged information, you're supposed to not read it, you're supposed to inform the person. So this is sort of the reverse, where if you accidentally say something on your Facebook that inadvertently discloses something about your client, you can get in trouble. Um, lastly, if you're friends with your client because you just really think they're an awesome person, that's cool, but you're not allowed to have business transactions with your clients, so, you know, if they're trying to get you to join their uh, recording company, don't do it. Also, <laughs> CRPC 1.8.3 prohibits attorneys from accepting gifts from clients. Again, just because... People aren't going to know if you're getting a gift from a client just via Facebook unless you post something about it or unless they post something about it. Like, wow, I'm so grateful that my client gave me this ring. It's so beautiful. And you have a picture of the ring. Okay, that could subject you to some liability. So again, be careful. Lastly, I titled this when you rather not know what your client does on the weekend. So, uh, Rule 3.3 says that a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made to the tribunal by the lawyer. This is related to your duty of candor. So, example, you see your client posting about using illegal drugs on the weekend. At the hearing the next week, the client wants to testify that he or she has not used any illegal drugs for months. What do you do? Ms. Berger. Well, <clears throat> but I, I wasn't raising my hand to answer oh, the question, sorry. but what I was raising my hand about is, um, as everyone in my firm knows, I train all of my people that we need to be adding um, cancel or terminate your social media account to our NCR form, and so I advise all of my clients of that, and I make sure the file um, has that documented, because as you noted earlier, so, I mean, we have clients who are in recovery and then they post a shot, you know, a, literally a shot and then doing shots. And of course the social worker ends up seeing it and attaching it. Or I've had a case of the domestic violence victim who posts a picture of her and her baby daddy um, after saying they've separated. And then there's always the issue of, well, when was the picture taken and this and that, but the fact that they're posting it on their account suggests that they're still connected to this person. So. In right. answering the question of why you shouldn't be friends with your clients on social media, I would say, well, you need to tell every single one of your clients not to be on social media because the social workers <laughs> are watching and there's no level of privacy that's going to protect you. I agree. 
and I'll yeah I'll get to that at the end for my tips. Um, number one tip being don't have social media, but number two tip being do not friend friend your clients. Uh, also, just a note that the Pennsylvania advisory opinion says that it is okay to friend your clients after the represent representation has terminated. But I would still be careful about that. So for this scenario, basically you can't you cannot produce false information, false testimony to the court. That's that is one of our ethical duties. However. Uh, honestly, if I was in this situation, what I would do is I would basically take the position that she, this, our client posted this on social media. Yeah, it was posted this whatever day it was posted, but that doesn't mean she, they, he or she was doing drugs on that day. Um, I have no actual information that this person is using drugs, and I would not disclose any of this information to anyone. I would keep it to myself. And regarding the testifying issue, that is up to your, I mean, up to your discretion on whether or not you feel like you have sufficient information to allow that person to testify despite what you know. I mean, I think that we have to be zealous advocates, and if you don't exactly know when this was happening or what was happening, it's not necessarily a lie to have the client testify that they have not used drugs for months. Just throwing it out there. Scenario three, friending an opposing party. So the rules were very clear on this, and I think we all know, but just to go over it, in representing a client, a lawyer shall not communicate directly or indirectly about the subject of a representation with a person the lawyer knows to be represented <coughs> by another lawyer, unless the lawyer has the consent of the other lawyer. And this applies even if the opposing party initiates contact. So even if the other client, like you have, you represent the mom, the dad messages you and is like, "Hey, I really, like, I really think you're doing a good job representing mom. I'd love to get my child back. I'm doing all these programs." You can't respond. This is pretty clear amongst all advisory opinions. You do not friend an opposing party. So. There's an opinion by the San Diego County Bar Association from 2011 about a wrongful termination suit where there was a former employee, a former high-ranking employee who was uh, represented, okay, so there was a former employee and then other employees were suing the company for wrongful termination. And so the lawyer representing the plaintiff wanted to friend this former employee because they believed that that person would say bad things about the company. Um, and the question is, is this okay? And the answer is basically no. So number one, a high-ranking official of a corporation does count as a party. And even, even a Facebook friend request can cons be considered an indirect ex-party communication from a represented party to another represented party. So in addition, um, it just... I think that's enough on that. Just don't do it because they are represented. This is very clear. You cannot talk to opposing parties who are represented by attorneys. Now scenario four. Friending slash following a potential witness on social media. So some examples I thought of, of my, why you might think about doing this is you might want to gather information on witnesses and third parties, collect posts to impeach a potential witness or gather dirt on that witness. And I put creating a false alias. It doesn't really matter if you create a false alias or if you use your own account. Uh, the general consensus is that you should not do this unless you, you adequately disclose that you have an interest in the subject matter of the litigation. So using a false alias makes it worse, meaning you create a fake account on Facebook in order to just for the purpose of friending these potential witnesses. There are three advisory opinions on this from Oregon, New York, and Pennsylvania that I found from 2012, 2013, and 2014. So basically, um, the, the New York opinion says that you, a lawyer can't use, quote, trickery to gain or secure information for, from a third party, even if they could have potentially helpful information. 
However, you can use your real name and you can use your real profile to do this as long as you disclose that you are an attorney representing X and that you do have an interest in the matter. So that basically the answer to this is yes, you can follow witnesses. You can try to friend witnesses. You just can't lie about it. You can't act like you're some uninterested person who just wants to be their friend because you don't want to be their friend. You want to gather dirt. The Oregon and the Pennsylvania opinions are also the same. There hasn't been any California advisory opinion on this that I've seen, but I feel like they would say the same thing because it, it, it makes sense, right? Like, it makes sense because we have these rules. <coughs> so, in the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person or fail to disclose a material fact to a third person when disclosure, you don't really need to know that part. Self-explanatory. You can't make false statements to third parties. And that corollary is this one, which essentially says that a lawyer shall not state or imply that a lawyer is disinterested, even if they're talking to someone who is not represented by counsel. So I guess a suggestion if you want to do this is, again, you can send a friend request, you can follow them on Twitter, uh, but message them or something saying that you are an attorney for blank and that you are representing them. Again, don't disclose details about the representation, but that you'd like to follow them as a potential witness. Again, I'm, make, I'm a little making this up, but, but I think you can see where I'm going, which is that you have to really identify yourself or else be subject to liability. Yes? Why do you need to do all that if it's uh, public posting and you're basically observing, not following, not whatever? Right. So that is different. So there, again, no California advisory opinion on this. But in the New York opinion, it specifically states that it is 100% okay to use public posts by a witness third party uh, for your purposes. The issue becomes when you're friending someone. And now, uh, some the opposite side, attorneys have tried to argue, but a friend request you know, requires their consent to, to add you, and so therefore, aren't they consenting to having you see their stuff, their posts? And the advisory opinion said no, because you're not disclosing that you're a lawyer who's interested in the matter that does rise to an ethical violation. But yes, public posts are A-OK, -okay, according to New York. Lastly, a lawyer shall not unlawfully obstruct another party's access to evidence, unlawfully alter, destroy, or conceal a document or other material having potential evidentiary value. You can't falsify evidence or assist a witness to testify falsely. You cannot advise someone to secrete himself or herself for the purposes of making that person unavailable as a witness. So here I, put, I bring this up because if you are friending a third party and it's, all, it's okay that you disclose who you are, you can't do any of these things then. You can't be like, oh, well, the county council wants to have you testify or they want to interview about this case. I recommend that you leave the state of California for a few months because you know that them leaving would help your client. You can't, you can't tell them to delete posts. You can't tell them to falsify posts or any of that, um, and that's specifically to that third party. Uh, to that third party meaning a witness. witness? Yes. So can we advise our clients, can you please deactivate your Facebook, take down that post about the dad, or can we not do that? You know, I think that is a tricky area because I think that that could fall within this, that a lawyer should not <coughs> ask someone to conceal a document or other material having potential evidentiary value. That's However, why I tell them to cancel their account before, I, before there's any evidence. I mean, yes, I think you can tell your are only bad news. Right. So if you document in your file that you've told them to terminate their social media account at the very beginning, you can then explain to them when it becomes a problem, you can say, you know, I advised you six months ago to terminate your account. This is why, because now they're using this evidence against you. 
I would agree that you can <laughs> advise your client to delete an account. I think that once the posts are made that are possibly incriminating or having evidentiary value are made by the client, I think it's a little hairy to tell them to delete it. However, know. the question is, what is evidentiary value? I, I, to me, I don't know. If I was analyzing this, it's like, well, yeah, maybe this client posted something that seems a little inappropriate or weird and you just think that it's better if they delete it. But that might not really have evidentiary value to the case at hand. So let's say it is in social media. So um, I know that my client has written a letter but not yet mailed it that says, Dad, you're a piece of shit and you've been using drugs again. And I have a conversation with her and when she says, you know, I'm, I wrote this letter but I was really just mad. And I say, well, I would suggest you, you know, destroy it. I cannot imagine that I'm violating that code of responsibility. How is that, how is that different? Just don't do it again. I, I just think, I think that that's not, I don't think you'd be subject to discipline because no one would find out. But also, but I still, no, 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 but for real though, I think that, again, the question is evidentiary value. So yeah, she wrote these words in anger because she was upset at the father, but what evidentiary value does that have to the case? Like, so it shows that she was upset one day and wrote a letter, that's irrelevant um, to me. I feel like that would be irrelevant in the case. Why, I mean, DCFS would probably say that's relevant because it shows she has anger issues or something. But in reality, I would feel comfortable telling the client to throw that away. I think that it really depends on the facts and it really depends on the nature of the case, the nature of the hearing, but. No, it's true, but she was mad. That's why she wrote it. <laughs> I guess I don't... Basically, yeah, yeah. I'm not retaining you. <laughs> I think it's okay to delete that, to throw that letter away. I think that, again, I'm not trying to give the answers. These are my opinions, but again, these are the rules. Like, this is it. If you have a different interpretation, or then it, it is open to interpretation. There is no guidance on this right now. There is no advisory opinions. Maybe I, I can call the Save Our Ethics hotline and see what they say. That's what I'll do, and I'll get back to you. Or you could even say that she did mail it to him, because that's like posting it, right? She sent it. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, but if they... If she mailed it to him, then he has it, so, uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> That's just wrong. I don't know, but I think that we should be cautious about telling them to delete social media posts, and that, that's just my opinion. Um, and I think it really depends on the facts. So, oops, sorry, another question. So what about advising a client who doesn't want to get rid of their social media completely, telling them to, if it's a DV case, for example, defriend the perpetrator or block the perpetrator? Yeah, that's I think that's okay fine. Under the I think, I think, so the question was, is it appropriate to tell a client to defriend the perpetrator or unfollow that person? I think that that is appropriate. I don't think that would violate any DV. And that's probably good advice. So now, responding to a client's social media post about your representation. So this is an example of like a bad Yelp review. <laughs> so someone gives a bad review of you on the internet and they say, oh, this attorney's terrible, she didn't do anything for me, whatever. Um, the main thing that you need to know is that you cannot violate your duty of confidentiality and that extends to current clients and former clients and even prospective clients. But there is one exception, which is the, quote, self-defense ex exception, which is if you are in pending litigation with the state bar, then you can disclose privileged attorney-client information, but I think that that's rare. If it gets to that point, that's a different story. This is just generally, you see a bad post about you on the internet, and you want to respond, because you want to set the record straight, and you want to say, no, I did everything for you. I made all your arguments. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, it's not good to do that, because you could reveal confidential information. It's really confidentiality, confidentiality is paramount. And this is the rule that 
I won't read, but it's talking just about your duty to a former client to keep things confidential. Friending a judge. All right, so the gen general rules about interaction with judges is that you're not allowed to do ex parte communications, you shouldn't do anything to try to influence the tribunal <coughs> for your, the sake of your client. So here's the rule, it's the CRPC rule 3.5, you can read it, it's also longer, I put it, I put the whole long version in the, the other handout that has the selected list of ethical rules. Um, but I'll just briefly go over some some other advisory opinions. So from Pennsylvania in 2014, they decided that it's okay to friend a judge as long as the purpose is not to influence the judge. Really, I think this impacts judges more because judges should be careful of this, I think, even more than attorneys because they have even additional ethical duties that they have to be fair, they can't seem to favor one party or the other, and if it seems like if they're friends with certain attorneys and not other attorneys, then it could lead to a claim that they are partial to those attorneys they're friends with. There is a ABA opinion from 2013 that says, judges must maintain the dignity of the judicial office at all times, and their posts on social media could impact that, not just regardless of the whole favoritism issue, but if they're just posting about the crazy weekend they had, it might show that they don't have dignity. <laughs> There's also opinion by the California Judges Association that, again, this is California. So California Judges Association, they had an opinion that was very strict and it said that judges cannot friend at all attorneys who have pending litigation before their courts. And so not at all. I also wanted to do, have a cautionary tale. I don't know the full story, but basically there was some someone somewhere made a fake Judge Laser alias a few years ago and tried to friend people pretending like they were Judge Laser. And so be wary of that because again, even if, if you're getting friend requests from people from, from Ladle, CLC, County Council, judges, you also should be cognizant that other people might be trying to get information from you uh, to use against you, uh, to use against your client, or for whatever purposes. So again, be very, very careful about that. <laughs> A lot of my training is be careful, so I apologize for sounding repetitive. When, uh, uh, Scenario seven, swiping right on your client. Yeah. Tinder One. reference, One. I know you all know. Okay, so you see your client on a dating website or app, and you're kind of interested. Maybe. I mean, the hurt wants what it wants. So, okay. CFPC rule 1.8.10. This is a revamp of the, the old rule. It's basically the same, but I just want to put it in there because I love this rule. It's, it's fun. A lawyer shall not engage in sexual relations with the current client who is not the lawyer's spouse or registered domestic partner unless a consensual sexual relationship existed between them when the lawyer-client relationship commenced. So, if I mean, if you happen to be in a relationship with your client beforehand, then it's cool, but in that case, I, I don't... I would, <laughs> I don't know, I'd be worried about conflicts of interest and other rules possibly affecting you, but basically don't sleep with your clients, hard line rule. <laughs> but to be honest, this doesn't really prevent you from swiping right on them. I mean, just saying, but be careful. <laughs> okay. Giving legal advice via social media. And I put legal advice in quotations because even if you don't intend to give legal advice, even if you don't intend to form an attorney-client relationship, you possibly can. So um, these are the rules from the CRPC. But in addition, there's a California Bar Online MCLE that gives some additional guidance on this issue. So Evidence Code 950, says that a lawyer is defined as uh, a person that's, quote, reasonably believed by a client to be authorized to practice law 
and is subject to attorney-client privilege. So the question is, do an attorney's words or actions on social media induce a reasonable belief, reasonable belief that the client is consulting the attorney in confidence to retain the attorney or obtain legal services? And the California State Bar CLE actually concludes that no, it absolutely doesn't because it's not reasonable for a person to read a social media post or put a social media post on an attorney's Facebook, whatever, LinkedIn, to think that that's confidential. So th the question is really confidentiality. Is the communication done in a way that conveys that it's confidential or not? And most of the time it's not because it's posted on some public forum or whatever. So that probably won't subject you to liability if you are telling someone something via the internet. However, I, I do think that it's very smart and advisable to use a disclosure. So even if you're advising someone online that you give the disclosure of these statements are not made for the purpose of representation or for legal advice. There are a lot of rules about attorney advertising in the state bar rules. We don't really deal with this, but I thought it was would be interesting to just talk about. So there's all of these rules in the California Rules of Professional Conduct. There's also the Business and Professions Code, section 6157, that outline what type of advertisements are permissible or not. For our purposes, posts on social media can be considered advertisements for legal services, even if you didn't intend for that. And I'm going to go through some examples here, which is from an actual formal opinion from 2012 from the State Bar of California. And I want to ask people what they think about these. So the first one, case finally over, unanimous verdict, celebrating tonight. So is this an advertisement? <coughs> Could this be an advertisement? Yes. Yeah. So the State Bar said, no, it's not an advertisement because it's not a message or offer that is considering potential employment or advertising potential employment. It just seems to be a personal post about your win. Second one, another great victory in court today. My client is delighted. Who wants to be next? Yes. Yes. So yes, no and yes. So the first sentence, um, another great victory in court today, is not considered a communication for the purpose of procuring legal services or soliciting legal services. But the rest is. Who wants to be next is clearly a question that's saying, you know, hire me basically. Who wants to be next? You're implying, the, another problem is that you're implying that you're going to get a specific result you're guaranteeing slash warranting a particular outcome, and that is improper. Now, won a million dollar verdict, tell your friends and check out my website. Yes. Yes. Yep, I mean, this one I guess is a little more clear because you're directly telling them to look at your website. <laughs> And you're also saying that you want a million dollars, therefore implying that you could get these amazing results and that everyone should hire you because you're going to get them a million dollars just like you got your other client a million dollars. Lastly, just published an article on wage and hour breaks. Let me know if you'd like a copy. No. Correct, no. So this is deemed by the California Bar to be only relaying information and the State Bar elaborates by saying that communications regarding seminars or educational programs that you as a lawyer might be putting on are protected as non-commercial speech because you're not, yes, you're not, you're not adding anything to solicit. You could imagine that this could be turned into something that might be commercial speech if you added one of the sentences above or something like that. But as it stands here, it's okay. So. I think in some, you see how words really matter. And one sentence can be okay, but the next sentence might not be. So if you are, ever do go into business for yourself, I think that these are important guidelines to keep in mind because social media is a really good way to get clients in these day, this day and age, but you do have to be very careful. 
So lastly, here are some tips that I came up with for navigating your ethical duties in the digital age. Like I said before, just don't have social media at all. And I put ha, because how many people here have social media? Okay, everyone else is lying. <laughs> Maintain strong privacy settings on your social media. We all probably know this because Facebook, you know, the whole Facebook debacle, and they're giving information to the whole Cambridge Analytica, whatever. That's all in the past. But not really, because <laughs> privacy settings are not really private. They are, they're better now. They are better now, and Facebook has told us how to protect our privacy settings, but not all of the social media companies do that. So you, you, you should be aware of that. You should be aware of the privacy settings and make sure you have the strongest possible settings in order to protect yourself from losing your bar license. Don't talk about your cases in any way, shape, or form on social media. And I can't stress this enough, how I think even a little harmless sentence, you might think, oh, well, that's not referencing my client, that's not referencing anything, but you don't know how the client's going to take it, you don't know how an opposing party's going to take it, you don't know if, if, if that client who gets TPR in the end looks back at your post and sees something and is like, well, you know what, I can tell this person wasn't fighting for me, I'm going to sue, or I'm going to do an IAC complaint, you just never know. So be very, very aware of what you're posting, and again, words matter. Pictures matter. Uh, I would consider a picture of some a picture of something related to your case the same as a as a communication. Don't act, don't friend your clients. Don't friend anyone involved in the case. Mostly opposing parties, especially while the case is open. And be aware that the internet is not actually private. I wrote that things on the internet may last longer than you think. I think probably most of us know this. But, for example, Snapchat was amazing because you thought, oh, you can take pictures and then they get deleted after however many seconds and no one will ever know. Well, they know. There's a record. There's a record of that. And everything that is an e-communication can be subpoenaed. So, again, don't think that you're safe necessarily because you have strong privacy settings. Don't think you're safe because you're using some new technology that supposedly keeps everything confidential. Um, be very, very careful. Does anyone have any questions? Or other scenarios that we want to talk about? I was, I honestly, I was just making these up. Has there been any issue with opposing attorneys being friends on any social media, connecting them with social media? Okay, so the, the question is, has, has there been any issue with opposing counsel counsels being friends on social media or other social media? And I did not see anything in my research. However, I think that what it does possibly bring up is your duty of loyalty to your, to your client and potential conflicts of interest. Because there is a rule that if you have a conflict because you are in a relationship with some other attorney or your friends or your you know, your, your babysitter, and this applies not even just to other attorneys, but to witnesses as well, then you should conflict off that case. You shouldn't have anything that, uh, that could be, that could appear to influence your duty of loyalty to your client. So, to be honest, I think that an argument could be made by a client that if you're friends with opposing counsel on social media, then, then in any case against that attorney, you're not fighting as hard for them as you would be. Isn't that the same thing, though, as if a client happens to see you oh and the county God. council in your courtroom out to lunch, like they just run into you and you're there, because so many of us have friendships in our courtrooms, it seems that it's the same whether you're friends in agree. person or friends mm -hmm. on social media, it seems like it's the same issue for the client in terms mm -hmm. of optics. Can you repeat the question? Yes, the question was, is, isn't that the same as if a client sees an attorney, like a label attorney, going to lunch with the county council or going to lunch with opposing counsel, would it, wouldn't that be the same analysis? And I think that, yes, it is. I think that that could potentially get you in trouble with the client. And again, all of this is potential. I'm not saying, oh, start unfriending everyone on your Facebook right now, because I have Facebook and I have, I'm friends with people from this courthouse. And really, 
but you're risking it. You know, you never know. Like I said, you have that one client who just hates you and everything turned out wrong for them, not because of anything you did, but then they want to bring this up to the state bar, they want to bring it up in some lawsuit. So again, I think that the best advice is just to be very careful. My advice today is to be extremely, extremely carefully, careful, over cautious, very strict. But in reality, I know that that's not, that's not realistic. <laughs> that's not really realistic, but I think that you, it's something that you should think about. But if you keep your privacy settings strong on Facebook and you don't allow clients to search you or friend you, then maybe that could help because then you keep your world intact and, and uh, closed off. Mr. Horlocker. I think what you're saying is absolutely correct about it being fact-specific. Mm -hmm. Revisiting the, uh, the, the thought scenario of you being friends with county council or going along with them. Uh, sometimes you'll have clients, for example, non any clients, who will ask, hey, do you have a good relationship with the county lawyer? Because I really hate the other parent and the county's really helping me out. And sometimes it helps to say, yes, I do work with this lawyer in other cases. Uh, and they want to know that you're able to collaborate and help them, uh, especially, you know, another example, we often negotiate settlements. It helps to have a good relationship with the future in your courtroom so that you can negotiate good settlements. That doesn't mean uh, favor opposing counsel over your client when it comes time to fight, but it's not, it's not bad to have good relationships with other people in your courtroom. So the comment was that it's not bad to have good relationships with other people in your courtroom and other counsel because that could actually help you in terms of getting settlements or working out something favorable for your client. And I do agree with that. I do agree. I, I do agree that we need to... Uh, our system is supposed to be non-adversarial and it's supposed to be more informal. Sometimes it does have to get adversarial, we all know this, but that is statutorily what our system is based on, is this like kumbaya thing. So I, I agree that you need to keep relationships with other counsel. Um, good, I, you need to keep good relationships with, with other counsel. I just think that maybe you want to keep that out of the public sphere <laughs> as much as possible. And again, it's not always going to be possible. You never know your client's going to see you going to lunch with someone, and it might not even matter. The, the client might even say, oh, cool, like, maybe, yeah, you can give me a good deal because it looks like you're having lunch with the county council and y'all are friends. But you just never know. So I think that you, as attorneys, we need to keep as much as we can private and contained. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>